Hi, my name is Kiara Lopez, and I will be presenting an original slam poem named The Space of You. What if I told you that for you to be here, the boundaries of space and time were stretched? What if I told you that for you to be here, billions of lives existed for you? What if I told you that for you to be here, people gave up their lives for yours? And what if you told me that you didn't want to live this life anymore? Stop. Breathe. What you think should be done should never be done. So before you continue, let me reassure you. Hear me out on what a miracle you really are. Because whatever is happening in this date, in time, in minute, it's not worth losing you. Because the hard times that will last forever, they won't. The waste of space you think you are, you're not. The life you think you have lived, you haven't even begun. You are not a waste of space. I know that the weight each of us carries on our shoulders is different for all of us, and that sometimes it can be so very heavy that we may be on our knees, bruised, bleeding, and busted, using all of our strength to lift it. But that is okay. No matter how heavy, you can lift it. You possess the strength to do so, even if it doesn't feel like it. Take a minute to think. Think of all you haven't seen, done, felt, touched, lived. Think about a time before you were born. Think about what love was made so you may be, what joy was felt when you were. If you take that state of mind with the things you love, the knees you thought you would once would buckle, would no longer budge. So why? Why would you let yourself say that you are a waste of space when space extended itself for you? When hugging another person, our bodies concave to make space for that person. Our bodies were born huggable. We were born in to fill in the space of each other. So you are never a waste of space if you were born to fill it in. You are not a waste of space. In fact, you are worth that space, every space taken up in someone's mind, every space taken up by your presence, every space taken up in someone's heart. The universe is a vacuous space filled with all things unknown and beautiful. But you never hear anyone say that space itself is a waste of space. So why should you be? So breathe. Breathe and don't leave. Don't provoke the dangers inside of you and the people who would die if you did. Don't breathe because you are important because you matter because you are the opposite of insignificant breathe don't go it's not worth it you are thank you hello my name is olivia and this is my poem He sunk his soul in dandelion wine, drowned his sorrows in the summertime. He knew no fear, he felt no sinking shame, and in his slumbers he forgot his pain. But when the winter came to dim the light, his hollow heart gave up and wouldn't fight. His demons crept behind his eyes and clawed away his spirit and his pride. Remember, child, the foolish man's regret when first he chose to drink and to forget. A memory is death and a rebirth. Forgetting is a blessing and a curse. Goodbye. Feelings can be too deep. All I want to do is sleep by Chloe Lidor. In a grove by the two lakes that is home to shamrock green frogs and shiny slimy snakes can be seen a place where the lost go to rest. 
their weary bodies when they need a calming sleep that takes away the stress of the lives they drown in, where they splash and cry. I am overwhelmed by all the feelings and sounds around and get told, be quiet, you're fine, or just try to get by. So they try to float, they try to get by, showing the signs they've learned to cope, but when asking questions, they lie. Offering smiles and niceties to the crowd around, as peering as if we're having a ball, when really everything feels too loud saying, I found my peace, I'm doing great, or I'm doing just, but they can't finish the line. The word gets stuck in their chest because it's just not right. They no longer want to lie and offer smiles and be kind. So they look the person dead in their eyes and say, I am not fine. And that's when it happens, the opening of their mind. A door, ebony colored and etched with vines, appears right in front of them and offers them a choice. It says, open me and find peace or keep me closed and fall to pieces. And without hesitation, they take that leap. And on the other side of that dark door, they see a grove tucked between two lakes that is home to frogs and snakes. Their mind goes blank sounds just right and they slowly slip into a soft sleep feelings can be too deep all i want to do is sleep and so i do and i dream of a place of peace and that's a great feat for a lost person like me identity is a hard subject to broach knowing how to know yourself how to express that knowing, how to parcel those fragments and make peace with them, it's not something that comes naturally. It's accompanied by the bitter promise of a battle hard fought, and I think it's one that I'm losing. It seems so utterly impossible to look at someone, myself, a friend, a stranger, as a person who exists separate from their identity. A dead body doesn't have labels, doesn't hold onto adjectives with its clammy, rigor mortis clawed fingers. All the soul of thinking and being and acting disappears around the ragged and shadowed bend when the end approaches and stops and then carries on. But alive people, the ones who have an impact, have purposes, make art museums and libraries of themselves, hold worlds and universes inside them. Their bodies get labels, their mouths and brains, and the curves of their spines tell stories. How can you separate identity from ideology? Ignorance from intent, from chapped and cracking and scarred knuckles, how can anyone ever assert that they truly and wholly and viscerally know someone else? Our bodies are made from the carbon that once found its home in stars located unimaginable distances away, places forever separated from our earth, from the myriad life forms inhabiting its surface, measured in innumerable light years. So have we not been influenced by all the things that every atom in our bodies has seen? Are we not the histories? Are we not the Venus branching scars, the fissures filled by supernovas and stardust spread over the years across our skin? Identity is intrinsic, inextricable, individual and collective, all of it seated deep within my chest, like the earth's molten core. So how do I possibly describe that to someone in just a sentence or two, mere moments after I've met them?
Every little girl wants her father. Someone who makes herself protected, loved, beautiful. Someone who gives her no need to seek attention from other men because he gives her it. And treats her oh so well that when she does find her lover one day, she accepts someone who treats her how great her father treated her. However, sadly, every little girl doesn't get that chance. She becomes a statistic. That fatherless child not given a chance. So she seeks love from the wrong ones, yearning for the love of a father. Being manipulated. Thinking this is the way a man is supposed to behave towards her. Thinking this is as close as she'll get to feeling beautiful. Accepting and settling herself for the wrong love day by day. A young girl born into a broken situation, this is the consequence she has to pay for it. Something she didn't ask to be born into, the toll they had in her life, greatly being affected by it. Never being able to be the innocent little girl who was daddy's princess. That chance. That one chance that could have prevented the pain she lives with every single day. That one chance of a little girl having an attentive father who spoiled her and reminded her constantly that she was beautiful. Never getting validation that she's enough. Looking for love from a man is what becomes of her. In relationships with men who only have power and control over the identity of her. Not caring because she has a man and that's what she's longed for out of it. So she settles, even if she is more than the way he defines or makes her feel beautiful. Because she never thought to see beauty within herself or loving herself for a chance. Depending on a man to make her feel worthy. Wouldn't need to do if she would have had a father. The only thing that could break the cycle is her choosing to love herself one day. To wake up choosing to find herself and not seek the approval of a man further any day. To take the time to finally learn and focus on her. Not search for a man any further to replace her desire for a father. To not let being fatherless control her life anymore, any of it. To heal, let go, not carry that pain. Finally give herself the chance. To look in the mirror despite the wounds from being fatherless and say, I am beautiful. To say that without a father being there, she's beautiful. To see value in her own self every day and realize that she never needed a man by any chance, and that it is not her fault her father chose not to be there for her, to accept that it wasn't her loss, it was his, and one day he will have to answer for it. And in the end, she is strong because she found validation within herself and not from her father. No longer living life with defects and not having that chance, no longer wishing it was given to her, reminding herself that she's still beautiful and slowly healing day by day, controlling her life now that she no longer chose to suffer from it, the pain caused by her father. Take a step, take a breath, lift your arms, let go. Let the darkness rise and wash away. Swirling mists, glowing lights, one more day. One more day, one more breath. Let go, be free, find your place, find your peace. Rain so fresh it makes us new, drops so pure, growing hope pushes through, pushes through, pushes through, push me through. Let me breathe, make me free, take these chains, take these walls, take these fears, please. Take it all. One more day to find these hands to create, to be me, to be me, to be free. If only, Lord help me, I could breathe. you guys doing today my name is adrian martinez and i appreciate poetry slam for giving me the opportunity to express myself through writing and today i will be presenting a poem called the true meaning of love love is what you give not what you get it's an act of kindness no regret in order to love you need to respect in order to love you need to accept who they are as a human being no matter their religion, political views, or the color of their skin, you get it. Let's be honest. I would love to gain love, but that's not how it works. You need to express love using your kindly words, especially your actions. Make that person feel like they're the main attraction. You'll feel incredible. You might cry. I feel free to explore the horizons of love. Take this chance to feel the atmosphere above. The saying is, love is blind. For once, I agree. The world has grown dim by setting awareness and forgotten luxuries of human nature. False claimant 
of identification under opulence and lost pursuits of happiness. Progression of materialistic desire, tangible and comforting, makes an easy escape for submissive minds and depleted souls. Cushions for dissociated happiness and growth from lack of communication within ourselves and the present world. Building codependency on objects that can't perceive love, yet it fills the void anyway. Flamboyant distractions, we pause and ooh and awe. Ah. Falsifying fascination and excitement for passion and love. The intent of soul is longing to acquaint the untethered from the finite affection of mundane possessions. This plane of existence is our Garden of Eden, created for communion and communication, yet we struggle to reconcile with uncharted family, asphyxiating on dissonant words in desperation for release and understanding. Ourselves no longer belong to us, but to the questions unanswered and the easily attainable answers. But there is no true understanding of this existence. Not until the absent mind is overcome with advertence and change is everlastingly accepted as it is. The sociability and liveliness of the soul is within question of the ability to conquer the transient mind. Upon the cosmos, you and I met, two tiny specks in this vast universe, destined to meet, and suddenly, chaos. The Big Bang, the meeting of two young souls, stupid and naive, yet to experience the darkness that life brings. It's funny how one small moment can lead to years filled with happiness, some days filled with sorrow and comfort, while others mindlessly filled with years of laughter. In a way, not of romance, we are soulmates. We complete each other in a unique way, one to last eternity, one much deeper than shy glances and momentary fireworks, one that gives me the courage to keep going even when the weight on my shoulders gets too heavy. When I was little, my dad would always call me princess. So I grew up thinking that I was the princess of two different kingdoms. One ruled by the queen and the other by the king. They said they just like it better that way. The queen always wanted me to study, but the king always wanted to have fun. The queen always put me in black and white dresses to match the black and white world I was raised in, but the king said he would love me even if I wanted to wear a colorful gown. Of course, I liked the king more. He let me do whatever I wanted to do and be whoever I wanted to be, and I thought that meant he loved me more. But then he started treating someone else's princess like she was nothing but a toy, an object for him to do as he pleased, and he told me he would kill any boy that treated me like a toy because, as he said, you're not just someone else's princess, you're mine, you're more important. I was young and naive, I didn't see the problems, I thought that meant he loved me. But then his vengeful Jezebel bestowed him with a painting of me in a rainbow gown. The queen was surprisingly supportive of my colors, but the king that I once adored transformed into a monster so vicious that it would attempt to rip the color out of anyone who didn't live in grayscale. The only way to survive the monster was to avoid it. If you give it no power over your life, it has nothing to feed on. And so I burnt down the bridge between the kingdoms. I can't believe I thought he loved me. I didn't understand that love isn't measured by the size of your kingdom. I was too young to understand that when the queen said no, it didn't mean she doesn't love me. Looking back now, I can see that every no and every we can't afford it was a knife in her heart. But I can only see that now because now I know that the whole time she was just protecting me. Because now I know that the person I looked up to was really the monster I should have been afraid of all along. It may have been easier to live my life in grayscale, but without my colors I would still love a monster.
Hi, my name is Amore and my poem is called The Stars Above Us. When I look into the window, I see shining stars beaming into the night sky. When I look deeper, we all the stars into that dark sky, but each star is different. Some might be duller than others, some might be brighter, but we all still beautiful in the night sky. Some might fall into space or even disappear into the night. We are stars that keep people staring in the dark sky at night. Every star is united in the sky like a family who never separates. When people see our shooting stars, they make a wish, realizing how important the stars are to their life. The stars see everything from above to tragedy to happiness. Us stars quietly watch over. Some wishes might come true, some won't. People still have faith in our stars since it might be their only hope. Many lose hope since they are, their wishes are not granted. Still, we are the beaming stars that shine at night. I'm Leah Janigan, and this is the tale of El Jardín de Mariposa, the butterfly garden. In passing, you heard a little local legend, ethereal beings, the latest obsession, visions of figures dancing and giggling, wandering wafts of herbs and incense leave minds dizzy. Lovers of peculiar pleasantries, existence withers. Rabbits race, bees buzz, and snakes slither. A renaissance begun in the butterfly garden. Witnesses to our right will not be pardoned. Smoke puffed from a pipe, white as a dove, floats through branches intertwined, tangled above. Spreading yellow flowers and broken limbs, under we sing our sweet haunting hymns. Hedges and canopy trees create our cathedral reverberating joy while preventing peaking people. A tragic trinity of star seeds, cunning and loved, laughter like sweet nectar, cheeks flushed with blood. Lost in clouds of burnt botanicals, something about them seems so intangible. Sprawled silhouettes blur behind blown smoke, soon to wax poetic we poems quite baroque. Journaling abundance intent from the soul, we paint sigils with bruised berries and crushed charcoal. Wet pigment stained fingers, grass wanes between toes, a strange sacrament to banish deep woes. Be covered in dirt, they prance and sing, look close, light catches on their dainty wet wings. A fuzzy fake glamour was gifted to this garden bubble, to enchant metamorphosis, mending meat so supple. Eccentric and feral, playing as our own jesters. The sun shifts, skin shadows thin and warmth festers. Disrobed to our nightgowns, we cool in hose sprayed mist. Sun rays refract off the water droplets. Dancing in the rainbow veil of vapor, ravenous for joy that will never taper. Dowsing ourselves in water, reality we repent. Devotion to the picturesque, our dark testament. Knowing we'll never leave our new birthplace, allowing water and worry to fling off silk and lace. Transforming in a thin clinging cloth cocoon, Changelings chant and swing to a gay tune. Collecting weeds and wildflowers to dry, sticky pollens flirts with inner thighs. Feet stomping in wind, we flutter and scream. Light catches chrome on tears and tattered dreams. Outside, nothing is worth it in our nymph eyes. Like a plucked flower, we're all destined to die. Sensibility and sanity has far been gone, finally releasing the illusions we bite down on. Forging a shrine under the looming lilac sky, the voices in the wind would never tell us lies. Bastards of reality, our resolve is calm, dragging the dagger down dirty palms. Darkness falls over the flower beds, our fate is drawn. Dry bushels and pine cones make our fire strong. Dripping life essence into flames off her blade, nocturnal creatures carry a sweet serenade. As moth replace butterflies, we howl at the eternal abyss. 
a new moon sky to the stars I blow a kiss, erupting needles and pins under tender skin, soon to release the power held within. With pink knees bruising green to merge with the world of the unseen, kneeling in a three-point constellation, lips flourish recklessly or fairy damnation. Our bodies, Our bodies are sacred, sacred hollow ground, ground. real world tethers we have unwound. unwound. Daughters, Daughters of Venus, Venus and Moon, moon. bounds of mortality, scarred and moon. Viewed by, by the power, power of three, three. We, we seek bliss, bliss from, from full of reality. reality. In unison we speak, speak under, under fairy, fairy tree, tree. I, I release to you what doesn't, doesn't serve, serve me. Wind whips through the garden, the ritual complete. Their bodies fall like dolls, lifeless meat. Wilted bodies amongst the bruised blossoms, an understated eldritch horror in autumn. Sh shedding themselves of their beautiful shells, change seeped deep into bones and cells. We've weaved our names into the void, the bridge back has been destroyed. Something bittersweet like raspberries hung in the air, our spirits released and stripped bare. Woodland sprites float up with auras aglow, with smiles that say you'll never truly know. Magic with fiendish innocence, no need to be subtle, to seize our desires, bemuse, and cause trouble. Walking the line between here and the next, nature welcomes her new subjects. Moss and grass overgrows their molt. Three bodies return to the earth with no revolt. The ground sinks as their bodies are consumed. Toadstools mark their forever tomb. Rosy eyes open to the spirit world's pulse and moan. We mock those who believe they are alone. We are not the odd ones, nor in the wrong, just because we'll do anything to get where we belong. There is no harder risk. It is the perfect pain. Living in it will pull you out of your skin in discomfort, and chasing it will only deliver a painful quest. Rageful passion is quite the novel by reading the blurb. Chapter three clears that mystery. Starting it may cost the world just as much as it can flow with no purpose. Keeping it is unnatural evolution and having it feels like particular revolution. Within the power of its invulnerability to the revelance of its right and wrong. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Adam Nazef, and I'm going to be reading my poem called Troubled Toys. Out from a factory that they call a god, born without their souls, wish to feel and break from their pods to live a life so full. Some are not so lucky. Voice box is broken, they can no longer speak. Fabric disfigured, a sight so sickly, all done by hands that wish to break. And so the, the others mourn, as they all ask why. The owner of the hands looked down in scorn. Too old, don't you cry. The playroom was emptied, with no one to speak. And they could only sit back in the corner, week after week. Hi, my name is Leonardo Manrique, and I'm going to be reading my poem called Butterfly. Stubborn mentality, too hard to take me down. I want to be happy, make it a reality. Lots of people that want to see me up, some want me down. Drinks to them, get up from the ground. No sticks to break my bones, but not like most. Envy makes it through, they throw stones. Keep my head up just to lie. Ask me if I'm okay, I just smile. Show them no emotion is my stuff. Walking with a limb, but I feel brand new, with a different view. Asking me for favors, damn who knew. I don't want to get ill, I just want the thrill. All the glory, no spill. 
couple stings but still moving effortlessly like a butterfly i can't tell no lie but if i tell you that i'm fine but i'll tell you that i'm fine pay attention to the mind is that time think about yourself get out of line counting all the numbers but i'm on my pride it's my journey and it's only mine My name is Rowan, and I will be performing my original poem, The Graveyard. I wrote for hours in the graveyard, headstones baking in the hot summer sun, overheated, my fingers tapping passively on my keyboard. Uninspired, reflecting on my world, I sit, as dead as the people around me, yet alive. Versions of myself lie in these graves, past selves, discarded useless. The graveyard is full to the gate, so it expands, making room for another empty shell. I get up, the sun too hot on my skin. I no longer want to write in the graveyard of myself. High up on the parapets lies the hidden gems of this old cathedral. They stare at the world, ever vigilant, looking out on the sloping Seine River, watching the people rush about enveloped in the sludge of their own actions. They keep the sickness of the world out of the church, for no villain would want to go near their grotesque faces, whether winged or fanged, horned or animalistic, they protect this place of worship. They stick out their grey stone necks to gaze at the world, their maws gaping from screaming at evil and from spewing out the water that tries to drown them. These devilish looking guardians pierce the air with their gaze, glaring at the malevolent, daring it to try coming near. They shelter the church from the poison embedded in humanity, allowing those who seek cleansing through the gaping oak doors to be stripped of the stain that taints their blood. This is their duty to safeguard the savior of humanity, to use their talons and claws to maul all malicious spirits that wish to corrupt mankind and restore the order to the world. The gargoyles' repulsive features will surely frighten all manner of creatures and will keep their charge shaped to bring hope to those who seek it. Hi, I'm Emily, and this poem is titled The Snow. The feeling that I'm feeling now is one I hate to know. Even though I've never felt before, I think this feels like snow. So delicate and soft it seems, sparkling in the light, inviting and entrancing on a cold, dark winter's night. But once you step into it and it's falling all around, you realize that beneath it hides a dormant, empty ground. It dirties up your shoes, your coat becoming heavy. The snowflakes fell before you, a damp mass of white confetti. And then the cold sets in, starting with your feet. Fingers placed in pockets, turning now you must retreat. But suddenly, the twinkling light, the magic all around, has dissipated, disappeared, and left without a sound. All that's left, a whistle of the wind within the trees. The droning fills your ears, the numbness reaches to your knees. That feeling that I felt before, the one you're feeling now, the ever entrancing emptiness of the snow upon the ground. Thank you. Um, my name is Destiny Fleming, and I'm going to be performing a poem that I made named Why Didn't You Scream Stop? So I hope you enjoy. Why didn't you scream stop? It's your fault. 
Maybe if your dress that wasn't so revealing or your smile didn't bloom so effortlessly every time he entered the room. Why did you scream stop? Why did you let him? Why did you lay there like a coward and let the tears run down your cheek instead of screaming stop? Why did you whisper no? If you didn't want it, you would scream stop. Now you're scared of men in their ways. You're scared to look a man in their face. You're pathetic. Stop. I didn't scream stop because nothing would change the outcome. His vigorous hands would still roam. Every time I moved, he clenched my waist much harder. There was no escaping that grip. There was no escaping that, manip that manipulative man. There was no reason to scream stop when I already mouthed no. There was no reason to beg for my body back. Why would I have to scream stop? I wore the dress because I felt pretty, not seductive. I smiled because I felt safe, not productive. And now I'm shivering with guilt. Why are you victim blaming the victim? Stop. I did scream stop. When I laid on the floor as my eyes grew waterfalls. I did scream stop when I mouthed no. I did scream stop when I pushed and pushed, but the grip around my neck only got tighter and tighter, and my face only got whiter and whiter, and the more I moved, the more I got tired, and the more pain I felt, the more he got higher. I did scream stop when I mouthed no.